morning, Pleasant View family. I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to continue our uh, walk through this great resurrection chapter. Now this morning we're going to begin in verse 12 and move our way through verse 34. As you're turning there, uh, I want to say just a couple of words about uh, the plans that we are making to begin meeting together in person as a church family. I sent an email about that out to you. I hope all of you received that on Friday afternoon. Uh, in that email was a survey. Uh, that's actually it was the purpose of the email was a survey. If you could take a couple of minutes as of the time I'm recording this, I've received 18 responses. I'm hoping to receive 50 or 60 responses. That's going to be very helpful in, uh, in guiding us as we make plans uh, moving forward. Uh, let me also say this. There will be no going back to normal, normal uh, as understood as what we used to do, the way we always used to do things. If and when that time comes, that's going to be way down the road. So I just wanted to, to share that to, to help guide you as you formulate and think about what's it going to be like to be back together again after all this time apart. Uh, don't expect it to look exactly like it did beforehand because it simply won't. And some of that, again, is explained in the guidelines in the, the survey that I sent. Uh, but the, the what we are planning, the, the specifics of the plans we're making, what matters just as much of that certainly is the how. Um, I'm sorry, not the how, the, the why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I'm starting to feel a little bit of the pressure because other churches in Crawford County are opening, but we don't want to be rash in terms of the why we take the steps we do. Uh, but then the how, the how we do this. At church, this is going to be a great opportunity for us to practice some of the things that we've seen in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the how, in terms of walking through uh, these weeks and months ahead, is going to be crucial. And it's going to show a lot about us as a church in terms of uh, how are we going to treat people who view this, uh, who have opinions about what we should or shouldn't be doing that are very different than our own. And so I am looking forward to this opportunity for us to grow as a church family as we reopen, so to speak, and start to gather again uh, for us to learn better how to love one another and how to defer to others whose opinions are not the same as our own. And so just want to encourage you as you pray for our church family, pray for unity and pray that the Lord would be teaching us in these days to love one another well. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read the text in just a moment. Let me pray for us, and then I'll, I'll read through those verses, and we'll go back and we'll unpack them together. Father, would you come now, and would you open our minds to your scriptures, that we might understand them, uh, both what they say, what they mean, and also uh, what you would call us to do in response to them this morning. We admit, again, our need of you every step of this process. Uh, would you transform us today by your word? We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And so uh, let me pause there. You see right here, this is the issue. I, I referenced it last week. I think we looked at it last week. There are some here in the church of Corinth that do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So there we see explicitly the issue being addressed here in this chapter. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. 
for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. And so what I want to do is I want to move through this basically in three units uh, to try to help us understand this section. Now, obviously, this is linked with what we looked at last week, the priority of the gospel message and the importance of of the resurrection of Jesus to that gospel message. So what we're dealing with here is Paul addressing an issue of gospel clarity in the church at Corinth. Uh, no resurrection means that there is a lack of clarity, a lack of truly understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is not a peripheral issue. This is never a peripheral issue for the church then, for the church now. We must get the gospel right. And so this picks up in verse 12 here. Again, tied in, linked with uh, what we looked at last week. So I want you to note a few things. The, the first section we're going to look at, it's actually two parts. Is some of the implications, and, and Paul is trying to help the church at Corinth see the implications of their belief about resurrection. Uh, specifically, this section of the church that, as he states here, they don't believe in the resurrection. And likely what that means is, doesn't mean uh, like an annihilation, uh, I'm sorry, an annihilation, annihilationism. That's one of those tough words to, to spit out. The, the idea that we cease completely to exist after death. Uh, likely for many of them, it was probably a belief that the, the soul or the spirit was good, the body was evil. And so what happens at death is the body is done, it's gone, and not to be seen or dealt with anymore, and the soul lives on. And clearly, Jesus rose with a physical body. And so the resurrection that Paul is speaking of here is both in reference to Jesus' physical bodily resurrection and also the resurrection that we believers will experience someday. And that's one of the threads I want you to see in this opening paragraph is how closely linked multiple times Jesus' resurrection is as paired with the resurrection of the believer. Uh, really, that's a thread that runs through this whole section. And so I want you to note those things. I want you to note, look at how the paragraph starts. Now, if Christ is, and look down to verse 20, because this whole paragraph is going to be contrasted in the next paragraph. Verse 20 starts, but in fact, Christ has been. And so Paul, again, there's this comparison and this contrast. And you'll see that in this opening paragraph, uh, verses 12 through 19, the word if shows up at least seven times in these eight verses. Uh, almost every time linked either directly or inferred, it's an if-then statement. Paul is trying to help them understand, again, the implications of their belief in no resurrection. And so let's walk through and simply point out what are these implications that Paul draws out. There's eight of them in this opening paragraph. And number one, if there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul makes clear twice in this paragraph, verse 13, verse 16. If that is the case, if that's really what's true, Christ himself has not been raised. Linking back to what we looked at last week, there goes that crucial piece of the gospel message. Number two, a second implication is that at the preaching of Paul, this is in verse 14, and the preaching of the apostles, if there is no res resurrection from the dead, uh, all of their preaching is in vain. Third, not only is the preaching of the, the apostles in vain, but the faith 
of those in Corinth. And by implication, again, the faith of all who would have made up the church at this point, their faith is in vain if there's no resurrection from the dead. We see that also in verse 14. Moving into verse 15, Paul, again, just trying to help them see the logical um, outworking of this belief in no resurrection. It means that Paul and the other apostles have been lying. They've been misrepresenting God because they have been teaching and preaching and sharing that resurrection from the dead is indeed a real thing. It is a true thing. And if it's not the case, then they have been lying, misrepresenting God. In verse 17, and if you remember, we focused on this uh, last month uh, around Easter. If the resurrection is not true, then again, their faith is futile this time is the word that he uses, and they are still in their sins. And if you remember, on Easter Sunday, we compared the, the two options. We're going to see those two options pop up again later in this passage, but every human being on this planet is either in sin or in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says here, if there's no resurrection from the dead, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's in verse 17. A couple more there at the end of this section. If there is no resurrection from the dead, those believers who have already died, they have perished. And the picture there isn't just that they're dead and gone, but they will now face judgment, ultimate judgment, because there's no resurrection from the dead, no hope of that. And then Paul ends that section in verse 19. If this is the case that there's no resurrection, he says, of all people, we are most to be pitied. Uh, perhaps a picture to help us think about that, a pathetic. How pathetic if we only have hope in Christ for this life right now. Now, I, I want to link down to verses 29 through 32, because down in those verses, in that section, Paul also is going to draw out some of the implications of if you really believe there's no resurrection, then how do you explain these two things? So look at verse 29. What do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Now, this is, if you've studied this chapter at all, you know this is another one of those phrases, ideas. We're not 100% sure what exactly Paul is referencing here. And what's the practice he's referring to? He doesn't commend the practice, but he doesn't strongly speak against the practice. Many believe that what he is referencing here would have been a practice of someone who was a believer but died before he or she had a chance to be baptized. And so someone else would be baptized on behalf of that person. Others believe that the reference to the dead there isn't to someone who was actually physically died, but it's a reference to the fact that our physical bodies are dead. Uh, they, are, um, they are prone to decay. And they are headed towards death. And so the picture there is that these dead bodies, uh, because this is just the nature of who, who we are as human beings, uh, that, that baptism, again, is this sign of accessing new life. And we need it, again, because of the fact that we have dead bodies. There are actually several other viewpoints of what this may mean. But again, it doesn't seem that Paul is real concerned about explaining the nuances of that statement. His point is this, whatever the reason is that people are being baptized on behalf of, again, whether it's a dead body, somebody who's died, whatever the reason is, it wouldn't make sense to even go through with those baptisms if there is no hope of resurrection. If it's, if it's only this life that matters, uh, regardless, again, of the reason people are being baptized on behalf of the dead and what they understand that to mean, there's no point to it if there's no hope of resurrection. The second thing he says then, uh, just after that in verse 30, why are we in danger every hour? And he's using himself as an example and the other apostles and his ministry companions. Uh, I protest, brothers, my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. So again, we're familiar from Paul's story, as we see in the rest of scripture, the suffering and the hardship that he endured for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 32, he says, what do I gain if humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? And likely this is a reference to human opponents. Uh, oftentimes scripture will put uh, animal type language onto human opponents. Uh, again, at Easter time, Psalm 22 is one of the, uh, the Psalms we looked at. And in that chapter, you can see an example of how scripture uses, again, 
animal pictures to describe human opponents. So he fought with these beasts at Ephesus. If the dead are not raised, so, so Paul is sharing, why, why would I experience these hardships? Why would anybody bother with persecution and suffering and, and dealing with these hardships for Christ if there's no hope of resurrection? If that's the case, he says, the only logical way to live life and the only world view, really, that would make sense to embrace. And what he does here is he quotes out of Isaiah chapter 22. I believe it's verse 13. And you can go back and look at the context, the story there of Israel uh, under judgment. And rather than repenting, uh, the viewpoint that they take is, well, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And Paul says, again, if there's no resurrection of the dead, not only does your, your baptism not make sense, your practice uh, in that arena, but... Why would anybody suffer persecution or hardship for the sake of Christ? If there's no resurrection, let's just make the most of today because there is no hope for the future after we die. So all of those from the first paragraph there and down here in these sections, at least 10 different implications that Paul points them to. If there is indeed no resurrection from the dead, you need to think through, you need to understand logically what that means for your life. But now we come back to verse 20. And I already noted the contrast here because Paul is sharing all of that to help them understand, again, the implications of their thinking. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And those who have fallen asleep are believers, again, who have died. Uh, that's what that is referencing there. And this, this word first fruits, which again is an Old Testament word, has roots back in the Old Testament. And this picture of uh, the, the first fruits being um, th th this deposit almost that was guaranteeing the rest to come after it. And there's this picture here in this paragraph of Jesus and his resurrection being a first fruits offering, so to speak. Uh, and that the idea there is that because Jesus has risen from the dead, he has, again, he's the first fruits. He is guaranteeing that after him, there will be more who will be resurrected from the dead. And here we have the great hope that I referenced last week, our glorification, our rising from the dead and being with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He said the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep and notice here he goes back to Genesis again, and he goes back to what we looked at a few weeks ago. If you remember, we looked at that story in Genesis 2 and 3, and even though uh, the serpent, Satan, went around the man and his headship and tempted Eve, and Eve was the one who actually took and ate of the fruit first, the man is held responsible for the sin. And we see that very clearly here. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so there we see this picture. Two categories of people on planet Earth. There are those who are in Adam, and there are those who are in Jesus Christ, the second Adam. And you can go back and look at the second portion of Romans chapter 5 is the clearest place in scripture where this uh, this truth here in these two verses is spelled out adam and then jesus as the second adam and all of humanity again would fall into one of those two categories in this resurrection life that comes through jesus christ verse 23 then because some might get confused it almost seems like verse 22 is teaching this universalism all will be made alive. Does that mean everybody's going to be saved? And similar to the language you'll find in Romans 5, if you look at that. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. So here's this picture again. Again, Christ is the first to experience this resurrection. And then after him, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And so there we get the clear, uh, the clarification of who are these all who are going to be saved, who are going to be raised. It's going to be those who belong to Christ. And again, this is where we would use the, uh, the total teaching of the full counsel of God to understand uh, this isn't teaching that everybody is going to be saved and experience this resurrection life. It is those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. And what I want you to see here, church, is 
it's incredible. Paul is explaining the importance of this resurrection truth, and he's giving us this panoramic view. So we, he's gone back to the Garden of Eden, to the beginning of human beings on earth, and Adam and Eve, and what happened there in the garden, and the implications, the impact of that through the ages of sin. And now he's going to take us all the way to the end of time, to the return of Jesus, and what's going to happen then, and why is resurrection so important to that? Verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. And this brings to mind Colossians chapter 2. But the picture here is Jesus conquering. It seems that, that what's being alluded or pictured here is Jesus conquering over the demonic world, over evil spirits, over evil period. Jesus will conquer all evil, all that is demonic. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And again, similar to the language we see in Colossians 2, Jesus triumphed over them in the cross. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so I want you to, again to see this picture of the end of time, this picture of Jesus reigning and ruling and having authority over both the demonic and over death over all of the evil, the spiritual world that is evil, and having authority over death. And then verse 20, uh, 27, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. And so here we start to get this picture of the Trinity, of the Father and the Son, which harkens back to chapter 11. If you remember, we talked about that briefly, uh, that idea of headship of, of the man over the woman. And this idea of God being the head of Christ. And here we see uh, one of the specifics of what that looks like. God has put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. And so almost Paul anticipating a question, he wants to make sure that no one is getting this picture here of God the Father being subjected under Jesus' feet when it says all things are subjected. No. God the Father is not subjected under Jesus' feet when all things are put in subjection to him. When all things are subjected, verse 28, to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. And so, again, we see this picture here of the Father and the Son, again, equal in nature, equal in essence, equal in power, but there are different roles. And here we see God the Father and Jesus the Son in submission or subjection to him and bringing all of these things that have been put under his feet, under his, his power. This is a reference back to Psalm 110, verse 1, if you want to look at that. That's a verse that's quoted several other times in the New Testament. Jesus brings all of that and subjects it to the Father, and the end result is that God... The Father is glorified. He is exalted in his glory. And so this beautiful, out of resurrection, the importance of resurrection, this picture of the Garden of Eden all the way to God being exalted as all demonic powers, all death is under the control, under the authority of Jesus, the Son. And now we move into the third unit that we want to look at here, because it's interesting. Paul has walked them through the implications of their thinking of no resurrection. And certainly his hope is that they'll see uh, really the ridiculousness of that kind of thinking. And he's painted this panoramic picture of resurrection and where resurrection and the hope of resurrection is headed. Uh, ties it back to the Garden of Eden and what happened there. And then verses 33 and 34 he lands on a very specific application for the Corinthians. And I believe, based on what we looked at last week, an uh, application for us related to what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ and to pursue together gospel clarity. Again, it, this is one issue that we must get right. Look at verse 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And some believe this is a reference to, to one of the Proverbs. Uh, some think that, that Paul picked this proverb out of some of the, uh, the literature that was current uh, out of that time, a proverb that, that his audience would have known well. But the, the picture there again, bad company ruins good morals. Who's the bad company here? Well, it's those in the church 
who are lacking gospel clarity, who are moving in this, uh, this lack of belief that resurrection is real. And given its importance to gospel clarity and understanding the power of the gospel, that's the bad company. Those who are moving again, speaking against resurrection. And the impact, Paul says, that's happening is some of the people in the church are being ruined by it. They're being impacted negatively by those who are espousing this wrong doctrine, this wrong understanding of resurrection and therefore wrong understanding of the gospel. And look at the call he gives in verse 34. Wake up from your drunken stupor. This picture of almost like these people in the church of Corinth, uh, some of these people are just kind of being strung along. They're just kind of going along with the crowd. They're going along with apparently what many others were saying was true without giving any thought or attention to it themselves. And Paul, almost a verbal slap in the face, tells them to wake up out of your drunken stupor. Think about this. Look at this for yourself. Remember the gospel that I preach to you, I believe, is part of what's behind this for him as is right, and do not go on sinning. What's happening is this wrong belief is leading these people to sin. Uh, certainly uh, what he has in view here is sinning in their thoughts and in their attitudes and their understanding, which always leads to sin in action. For some have no knowledge of God. So again, the picture here, this bad company, Paul now calls them, these are people that have no knowledge of God. They don't understand this gospel correctly, certainly this resurrection piece of the gospel correctly. And he says, I say this to your shame, is how this section is. And Paul's point here, this is at least the second time in the letter that he's specifically said something in order to shame them. And to shame them for a good purpose, not just to leave them in that shame, but he's calling the church here, he's calling the followers of Jesus to separate themselves from those who have no knowledge of God, from the bad company, from those who are spoiling the gospel, who are espousing a wrong view of the gospel, who are cloud, uh, causing the, the gospel to become cloudy. And he's calling uh, the Christ followers to separate themselves from those ones. And so let me go back, and this is where we'll end for today, church. Back to what we talked about last week. If you remember the formula that I gave, one of the most insidious realities in our modern church area is the idea that someone, uh, that a person could identify as a Christian while having no intention of following Jesus or becoming like Jesus in character and priorities. And again, that, that word insidious, it's, it's been slow growing. Sometimes it's hard maybe to see it. But my, my guess is that most of you have encountered this on your journey at some point. Again, people who would, the way I put it last week in that formula, people who would have some understanding, some mental assent to, a, to justification, to, to what, what it means to be declared righteous in the sight of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. And those same people would have this hope of glorification, this hope of being with heaven someday. But what's lacking in their life is any experience of sanctification. And certainly sometimes this may come from ignorance. This may come from people just uh, being under bad teaching that doesn't uh, lead them in that direction. But for many people, how convenient is that? that I simply have to believe with my mind certain things and I get this great hope attached to it and there's no practical reality that impacts the allegiance of my heart right now. And again, this is one of the most damaging, in my opinion, realities that exists in our modern day church. The idea, again, that I can be a Christian, I can identify as a Christian with no intention to follow Jesus and no intention to become like him in my character, in my lifestyle, in my priorities. Clearly, and I showed you from 1 John last week, that goes against the teaching of Scripture. And what happens, church, when we start to move into that territory is we move into a lack of clarity about the gospel. Because sanctification is part of what it means, experiencing and walking in sanctification is part of what it means to genuinely experience gospel salvation. And so... I would say to us this morning, church, in light of this issue of gospel 
clarity. Because for us, I don't think the, the issue is resurrection the same way that it was for the church at Corinth. But I do think before us, right now in our present time, is this issue of gospel clarity related to sanctification. And so for some of us, the message we need to hear is this. If you are one of those people who, again, has some understanding of justification, you can even look back at a time in your life when you would say you put your faith in that justification and you have hope of being with Jesus someday, but you can't look at your life right now and see any evidence of actually following Jesus, of Jesus transforming you, of Jesus making you more like yourself, this call to wake up is for you. This call is for you to examine your understanding of salvation. And I would implore you, I would beg you to please contact me or contact somebody that you know who is a Christ follower and to seek clarification on what it means to truly be a Jesus follower and to, to be walking in those truths we looked at in 1 John chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 last week. There's also a call here for those of us who are following a Christ, who are walking with Christ, that we want to be those who are not finding ourselves following after uh, someone who would believe that sanctification is optional. And here's the way I think it oftentimes looks, is that within the church, uh, those who would those who would take this view of, well, I, I said a prayer and I, I gave mental assent to justification and I have this hope of being with heaven and I'm confident in that, but I'm not following Jesus. I don't have any intention to. We would kind of put them at the low end of the spectrum and say, okay, well, they're a Christian and given the choice, that's the kind of Christian that I want to be. And we can find ourselves being influenced away from following Jesus and becoming like Jesus. Because it's almost like a buffet, and if that's one of the choices, that I can follow Jesus, and I don't have to have the allegiance of my heart challenged, I don't have to have any intention of following him or being like him, our human nature is going to, in many cases, we're going to drift towards that. And so there's a warning here, church. If you find yourself in this position of you've drifted to, to this belief You've drifted to this practice, this lifestyle of it's okay for me to call myself a Christian. Again, with no evidence in my life of becoming like Jesus, you need to wake up from your drunken stupor. You need to go back and look at 1 John chapter 1 and 2 that we looked at last week. You need to go back and read chapter 15 verses 1 through 11. Clearly, over and over again, Scripture calls us, again, we are not saved by our works, but our works are clearly evidence of being saved. A faith without works is dead, is the way that James chapter 2 puts it. And so there's a call here to gospel clarity, and that's what I want to call us to this morning, church. Can you identify places and ways in your life where you see Jesus actively transforming you? And, oh, I want to I want to give a word of caution because I, I, I don't want anybody to, to receive this teaching as a works righteousness or you need to try harder to earn your salvation. That's not what I'm trying to uh, teach or to put forth in any way. But I want us to see the importance of our works, our growing in Christ likeness as evidence that we truly have been born again. And I want to call us to again examine our hearts to take this seriously and to wake up from our drunken stupor if that's the step we need to take. And one of the easiest ways to help us with that is if you're worried, concerned that you may be one of those people that needs to wake up, talk again with a trusted friend. Talk with someone you know that's following Jesus and let that person help you and pray with you as you seek to take steps to follow Jesus in resurrection life and resurrection power. So that's the challenge for us uh, this morning, church. Again, uh, my hope is as we move forward as a church, gospel clarity is going to be one of our top priorities. So let me pray for us. Uh, again, I, as always, I invite you, if you have questions or comments, you need further clarifications, we'll meet online tonight. And uh, you can always email me, call me, get a hold of me any other way. I uh, would love to help you examine these truths as they relate to your walk with Jesus. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you again for the clarity of your word and how we pray for, uh, we pray for Pleasant View, but we pray for the church at large. Uh, this morning, let's pray for the, all the churches here in Crawford County. Father, would you grow us in gospel clarity that we might understand 
your good news. Your life, Jesus, your death that has purchased our salvation. Your resurrection that uh, it, it signifies that your sacrifice was sufficient and how thankful we are for that. And how one of the evidences that we truly belong to you is resurrection power. It's resurrection life being birthed in us as your children. Uh, would you help us to understand that? Would you help us as we examine our hearts and we, we look for that? And would you lead each one of us, wherever we find ourselves this morning, uh, in you or in our sins, would you lead us to yourself? Would you grow us? Would you transform us for our good and for your glory? We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Sanctifier. Amen. Thank you, church. Hope to see uh, several of you online tonight. Again, 630. I'll send the link for our Zoom meeting, and we will spend some time talking about this, about our upcoming transition steps, and anything else that's on your mind.